they go with this lesson if you haven't noticed that. So give me the Bible. Show me, give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the water lone in tempest tossed. No storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, long love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal. I'm going to take off my preacher hat and put on a, a teacher hat for just a little bit. I, I'm going to do a little more things that I don't normally do, and except whenever I'm on TV, I'm going to do more reading than I normally do. You may not know this, but I read my scripts on TV. I hope you knew that I, I didn't read them. I hope that's what you thought. But I do read them, but I wrote them. So they're my words, and so that's the way that it goes. What I want to do tonight, because there are some technical things here, I want to make sure that I get this as close to uh, the accurate in quoting other people and in some of the things that I think you'll find quite valuable. Now, Jesus promised those who believed in him, the Jews that believed in him, he said, if you abide, if you continue, if you dwell, if you stay 
in my word, then you are truly, you are indeed disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That is a tremendous, tremendous promise. You know, most of the time, whenever we talk about uh, the world and how the world thinks of who is a disciple of the Lord Jesus, who is a disciple? Well, we think about John 13, 34, and 5, which makes the statement uh, where Jesus says that we ought to love one another. A new commandment give I to you that we love one another. And then he says, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. And then he says, by this shall all men, that is the people of the world, everybody around him, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Well, now that's how the world knows that we're disciples, is by our love one for one another. But how does Jesus determine who is a disciple, that is a learner, a follower, someone who imitates him, someone who makes it his purpose of life to be like his master? Who is the true disciple in Jesus' thinking? And he says, well, if you abide in my word, you stay in the word, you stick there, you stay with what I taught, you read it, you study it, you meditate on it, you don't go somewhere else, you don't look at other things. If you abide in my word, then you are truly, King James says, you are indeed disciples of mine, truly disciples of mine. That's how Jesus judges who is and who is not a disciple. Do you stay in the Word? Do you stay in the book? Now, by saying this, Jesus assured us that we can truly know the will of God. If we stay in the Word, we'll know the truth, and the truth can set us free. We don't have to be ignorant people who never know what's right and wrong. We don't have to be ignorant people who don't know what's going to happen when this life is over. Uh, I think one of the... Uh, most popular studies I've done through the years is a little study called Afterlife. It's a condensation of a course that I teach on last things, that is, uh, the things that happen in our futures. We're talking about our soul and what's going to happen when we die and about heaven and hell and all of those kinds of things. It's a little book called Afterlife, and I was talking to the young man that works with me yesterday, and he said, well, he said Phil, we don't have any more of these. Now, you can get a, an e-file copy online at searchtv.org. Uh, but he says, we don't have any more because people always want to know what's going to happen. I had a lady call me uh, the other day, and she said, what's going to happen to me when I die? Am I going to heaven or am I going to be lost? She was interested, and I tell you what, we ought to be interested. If there was ever anything that we ought to think about, that's one of the things that we ought to. Well, the way that we know the truth about what's going to happen to us after this life is over is found in this book and in studying the Word of God and staying in it, not listening to the philosophies of men, but looking at the book itself. Well, someone says, do we have a reliable Bible? Do we have a Bible we can trust? And how do we know we can trust it? Well, let's talk about the Old Testament first, and then we'll talk about the New Testament. 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New Testament. These books have been around a long time, and I can say to you with great confidence that there has never been any document in the whole world since the beginning of time that has been more explored, more scrutinized, more looked over, more taken apart and put back together than the Bible. The Bible. When we talk about uh, the text, the Hebrew text that underlies the Old Testament, uh, if we ask the question, is it accurate? How do we know what it said? Well, if we know a little bit about what's called the Masoret, uh, Masoretes and the Masoretic text, it helps us to understand some things. The oldest copies of the Old Testament we had a hundred years ago was the Masoretic text that came from the Jews. Now, this text was uh, copies of the Old Testament that had been copied and copied and copied, and the old copies, when they wore out, they would dispose of them. And so we didn't have anything that was old, old, because those things would be gotten rid of whenever copies were made 
and they were checked over. Now the Masoretes were Jewish scribes who preserved the sacred letters and they lived from about 500 A.D. to 950 A.D. And they meticulously copied the Old Testament, counting letters and lines and showing the utmost respect for the sacred text. They wanted to make sure they got it right. But then along came the 40s, the 1940s and 50s, and along came the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, there was a place over there, Qumran, where they had various caves where scrolls were kept in jars. Now these jars were large jars, uh, and they had a top on them, and there would be all kinds of scrolls inside of them. In fact, there were thousands of them. And they began to look at them. And uh, these scrolls were kept by a group of people that most scholars call Essenes. They were scribes, and they had a lot of different things that were there. But there were an awful lot of books of the Bible that were very, very old found in these jars. In fact, uh, there were parts of every book of the Old Testament, except the book of Esther, that were found in these, scroll, in these jars, and the scrolls were among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so uh, they found these, and there were thousands of them, and they were 1,300, some of them as much as 1,300 years older than the Hebrew manuscripts we had from 900 A.D., and that goes back to 400 B.C. That's a long time before the time of Christ. And by the way, many of these prophecies that you know about and I know about were in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we have proof that they were written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. I want you to remember that. Hundreds of years. One of them is Isaiah 53. When I was in Jerusalem in 2006, one of the, one of the only, only heartache I had during the, all the time that we were there in Israel was that I didn't get to go to the Museum of the Bible to see some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and especially the Isaiah A. Scroll. Now, very frequently, whenever somebody does uh, the Lord's Supper and they're standing there, they want to read from Isaiah 53. A hundred years ago, many of the scholars believed, oh, Isaiah 53 couldn't be part of the Bible. Somebody just added it. But you see, when they found the Isaiah A scroll, which dated hundreds of years before the time of Christ, and Isaiah 53 was right in the middle of it. They couldn't doubt that anymore. For by his wounds you are healed, by his stripes you are healed. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he openeth not his mouth. All of those prophecies we think of the death of Jesus. And they are hundreds of years older. And now we have proof of it in a manuscript. That, to me, was a great reason for believing in the Old Testament. But one of the things that they found that was so interesting is when they compared those passages from the Dead Sea Scrolls with the passages that came from the Masoretic text in 900 A.D., they found this, and I'm quoting now from a scholar named Gleason Archer in his book, A Survey of Old Testament Introduction, this is an introductory book that would be about the Old Testament that is used in graduate schools. These are, not, these are not slouch dummies that write these things. These are scholars who spent their whole life studying such matters. And he says that um, he observed that the two copies of Isaiah from Cave 1 in Qumran proved to be word for word identical with our standard Hebrew text, the Hebrew Bible. In more than 95% of the text, the 5% of variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. Hebrew scholar Miller Burris writes, It is a matter of wonder that through something like 1,000 years the text underwent so little alteration." As I said in my first article on the scroll, herein lies its chief importance, supporting the fidelity, the trustworthiness, the truthfulness 
of the Masoretic, Masoretic tradition. I tell you, we can have uh, trust in the Bible. Another scholar, a fellow named uh, R. Laird Harris, in the book that he wrote, Can I Trust My Bible? And R. Laird, Laird Harris wrote a book on the encyclopedia of Bible difficulties. This man has studied all kinds of languages, has studied the Bible all of his adult life. And toward the end of his life, when he was writing that book, one of the things that he said was that all of these things that he had studied through all of these years, he had never found one proven contradiction in the Bible. Not one. Now this man knew several languages from ancient times, but he had confidence that the Word of God could be trusted. And here's what he said. We can now be sure that copyists worked with great care and accuracy on the Old Testament, even back to 225 B.C. Indeed, it would be rash skepticism now to deny that we have our Old Testament in a form very close to that used by Ezra when he taught the word of the Lord to those who had returned from the Babylonian captivity. Sir Frederick Kenyon said that the Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in it the true word of God handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. But if you ask me the greatest reason why I believe the Old Testament is true and accurate is because of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. You see, everywhere He quoted from it, every time He referred to it, He trusted the sacred writings as the authoritative and the unbreakable Word of God. In Matthew 4, the Lord Jesus faced down the devil three times with quotations from the Old Testament, specifically from Deuteronomy, saying, it is written. Now, this phrase, it is written, could easily be translated, it stands written. In other words, it was written when they wrote it, and it's still written today. It was true when they wrote it, and it's still true today. It was authoritative when it was written, and it's still authoritative today. And that's what Jesus told the devil 1,400 years from the book of Deuteronomy, 1,400 years after it had been written. It stands written. I like that. I like that. You remember Jesus recognized that the words found in the Old Testament would never perish. For truly I say to you that until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, I know we called it iota when I was a kid, but it's iota. <laughs> and not a dot, those small letters, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Matthew 5 and verse 18. When challenged by the Jews, Jesus pointed to the scriptures that were written hundreds of years before. And he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. John 5, 39 to 40. Because Jesus regarded the scriptures as the standard of truth, he told the Sadducees, he said, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Matthew 22, verse 29. The implication is that the scriptures are inerrant. That is, they do not have mistakes that they are not wrong, that they are not something that can uh, lead you astray. And I think we have to understand that aspect. Jesus placed the Scriptures above any traditions of men. He talked about the traditions of men in Matthew chapter 15, also Mark chapter 7. And He talked about how that the traditions of men would lead people into error, would make their worship vain. And he said, uh, you know, that their worship would not be heard, would be in vain because they obeyed the traditions of men. He said in Matthew 15, verse 13, that every plant, speaking of these human traditions, every plant which my Father has not planted shall be rooted up. That's something for us to think about. 
All of these ideas that people come up with that are not biblical. Every plant which my father has not planted shall be rooted up. There was nothing in the mind of the Lord Jesus more important than conforming with the truth. And we'll talk about being wise and being foolish at another time. But he wanted people to be wise, to hear what he said and to do what he said. And in every instance that Jesus cited the Old Testament, and there are more than 30 of them where he quotes, he regarded it as utterly true. He talked about Noah. He talked about Adam and Eve. He talked about Jonah. He talked about others. And in every occasion where he had a reference to the Old Testament, he believed it to be true. Real historical events, not some story that somebody dreamed up. When we think about how Jesus regarded the Old Testament, it helps us to know how we should regard the Old Testament. And for these reasons, we can stand with Jesus and hold to the accuracy and the unchanging character of the Old Testament. One of the things that's so interesting is all the things that these Masoretes would do whenever they were making copies of the Old Testament. Uh, Samuel Davidson lists the following rules for these people who were making copies. He said, a synagogue roll must be written on the skins of clean animals. Isn't that interesting? It's going to have to be a clean animal, not, not one of those that were unclean. It must uh, be prepared for the particular use of the synagogue by a Jew. These must be fastened together with strings taken from clean animals. Every skin must contain a certain number of columns equal throughout the entire codex. The length of each column must not extend over, uh, over less than 48 nor more than 60 lines. And the breadth must consist of 30 letters. The whole copy must be first uh, lined. They would have a little line. If you look at some of these old copies, you can see the little lines that they had when they would write the letters on those lines like we would have in our notebooks and have line notebooks. He says, and if three words should be written without a line, it is worthless. You've got to have more than three words on those lines. The ink should be black, neither red, green, nor any other color. Next time you look at your red, red letter Bible, remember that. He says, it needs to be back, neither green, red, or any other color, and be prepared according to a definite recipe. An authentic copy must be the exemplar from which the transcriber ought not in the least to deviate. No word or letter, not even a yod, which is like a, an apostrophe, or, uh, a, a, excuse me, yes, an apostrophe. I'm having to get my grammar down here. Just a little, a yod that has kind of a Y sound to it. Yahweh starts out with a yod. And he says, uh, he says, not any of that ought even, he says all of that ought to be, must be written from memory. That is, he looks at it and he writes it from memory. The scribe not having looked at the codex before him, he just knows that it's there. He's memorized it. He's written it down. Going to get it just right. Between every consonant, the space of a hair or thread must intervene. Between every new Parasa or section, the breadth of nine consonants. Between every book, three lines. The fifth book of Moses must terminate exactly with a line, but the rest need not do so. Besides this, the copyist must be in full Jewish dress. He must wash his whole body. He cannot begin to write the name of God, Yahweh, with a pen newly dipped in ink, because if it was newly dipped, it might smudge. They thought the name was so sacred they didn't want to do that. Should a king address him while writing that name, he must take no notice of him, that is the king, until he finishes, of course. These were some of the regulations that they had. And this is why it was able to be sustained through the years. Okay, do we have a reliable New Testament? How do we know this? You know, there have been a whole lot of books and things that have been written by people in the last three, four hundred, uh, about the last 
about that early three, four hundred years of those first days, about all kinds of strange things. You hear, oh, it was, uh, the Bible was given in the fourth century. We didn't have the New Testament until the fourth century. That's not true. That's not true. We have people who say, oh, Constantine, whenever he was in power in that early fourth century, he was the one who made up doctrines that went into that. That's not true. You see, we have copies of the New Testament that are older than Constantine. It was about 10 years ago that I was able to go up to Michigan, to the University of Michigan. And uh, they have a library there, and I went up on the eighth floor, the top floor of that library. And the eighth floor is uh, very guarded because they have ancient manuscripts there. And I held in my hand one of the leaves of Papyrus 46. Man, I'd rather held that Papyrus 46 in my hand, that one leaf, than to spit in the Grand Canyon. It was the most, one of the most exciting things that I'd ever done in my whole life. P46 is the earliest existing copy of the writing of the Apostle Paul. Some date it around 200, some as early as 150 A.D., some a little bit later than 200. But that is the earliest existing writing. And P46 has a hundred over a hundred leaves. Forty percent of it is in Michigan, the other 60 percent is in Belfast, Ireland. And it was an exciting day for me to hold that in my hand. And let me tell you something. What I held in my hand were the last few verses of Romans and then there was a break and then there was a, uh, a kind of a headline of the next book and then the first chapter of that book. What book do you think that was that was after the book of Romans? You'd say 1 Corinthians, wouldn't you? Nope, it wasn't. It was the book of Hebrews. That does not prove that Paul wrote Hebrews. But it sure is a strong argument that the people in, in the second century believed he wrote it. And I, I believe that he wrote it. But I, I can't prove it. And neither can anybody else. I think it was Origen in the early 300s who said, whenever somebody asked him about who wrote the book of Hebrews, and he said, only God knows. That's where that phrase came from, by the way. Only God knows. Now, what I'm saying to you is we have manuscripts that are much, much older. Much, much older. When the King James Version was translated in uh, the early 1600s, 1611, uh, they had only about 12 to 15 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament that they consulted. That's all that they had available to them. The earliest copy of the Greek New Testament that was in a book form, not these old manuscripts, but in a book form that was published on a press, was done by a fellow named Erasmus in 1516. And that made it available to everybody because he had collected about these, but he only had six manuscripts. And in fact, there are parts of it in Erasmus's copy of the New Testament that is not found in any known manuscript because he translated parts of it when he couldn't find it in Greek from the Latin and it wasn't correct especially the last portion of the book of Revelation 1550 came along and uh, then they had as many as 12 to 15 in 1598 Theodore Beza uh, said they had about 25 manuscripts now that was the one that the King James Version came from not the 12 to 15 but the 25 manuscripts and that's all in 1707, John Mill, whenever he put out a Greek New Testament, published it, he had access to 78 manuscripts. In 1881, and then in 1901, many of you know about the American Standard Version of 1901. Well, there was an English Revised Version that came out in 1881. They had as many as 1,500 manuscripts available at that time. They only had one papyrus, and they had 64 of the unseals. Now, the unseals were old. 
most of what they had during the days when the King James Version was translated were written out in what we would think of, it's, it was a different name those days, minuscules, but it was like in cursive. And the letters were smaller, so they had minuscules. But whenever the oldest manuscripts were done, all of the letters were written in capital letters. And there were no spaces between the letters. Well, they had 64 of those whenever Westcott and Hort came along that were much older than the minuscules, the ones that were written in the cursive. You see, around eight, 900, they learned that, you know, we can put a whole lot more words on this manuscript, on this skin, on this paper, or whatever they had to write on. The paper came along about 900. Uh, they decided they could put a whole lot more words on there if they wrote it in cursive rather than in these capitals, you know, the big letters. Now, why did they put them in capitals and big letters? Here's why. Because the earliest churches had people who stood up and read what was written to the congregation. People didn't have their own Bibles. Bibles were very expensive. A copy of the book of Romans would cost 25 days wages just for that one book. So churches didn't have very many uh, written copies of this or that. They had one that everybody heard from and there was a fellow who was a reader and he would read it publicly. Now then, turn with me to Revelation 1 verse 3. And there are other passages that go along with this. But in Revelation 1 and verse 3 is a blessing. And I don't know about you, but I always missed this whenever I was reading it back years ago. I missed what he was saying. But he says in verse 3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. Well, now I thought about that and I thought, well, well, I'm reading it. Well, of course I am and you are too because we have our own Bibles. But when he was talking about here in the first century, in the latter part of the first century, he was talking about blessed is the guy who stands up and reads aloud and those who hear. Why? Because these books would be written uh, down and then they would be read in the churches. And that's why he says to the church of this right, to the church of that right, and all those seven churches. And so that's how they did in ancient times. That there was a reader and there were people who listened. Uh, in 2018, a few years ago, uh, whenever they put out uh, the latest edition of the Greek New Testament, they had access to 5,814 manuscripts, 128 papyri, 322 of the unseals, 2,911 minuscules, and then there were 2,400 lectionaries. Now, what are lectionaries? Well, this was where they had some kind of a commentary or something and they would have the Bible interspersed all the way through it. And mo many of these were quite late. But they had a lot of different things in those days. But we have more manuscripts than, than anybody that uh, has ever been around. We have more copies of the Bible, of the New Testament, than any ancient book that has ever been written. Now, someone says, well, I read or I heard that there were a whole lot of variants in the New Testament. And someone says, uh, you know, there are 138,000 words in the, in the Greek New Testament, but there are 400,000 variants in the manuscripts. And I get people all excited about all of these variants that are in the manuscripts. Well, the fact of the matter is that that 400,000 appear in the 5,814 copies, which if you put them all page by page by page, would have millions of pages. And 400,000 on these millions of pages and words adds up to about one every seven pages. One variant every seven pages. Now let's have a little let's have a little uh, a little experiment here. If I said to all of you, let's go home and let's get out the book of Philippians, four chapters, a little over. 
Heaven. And we're going to make a handwritten copy of the book of Philippians. Now, since we want to look at the, compare things, we're going to make it all from the same, same version. We're going to make it from the same version. And we're going to use that version as our exemplar, and all of us make a handwritten copy of what's in that. How many mistakes do you think we'd make in this group of 60 or so people, 70 people? I don't know how many are here tonight. But how many mistakes do you think we'd make in a handwritten copy, 60 or 70 handwritten copies? Now, you're, you know how to read. You, you guys have been writing your whole life. How many mistakes do you think we'd, why we'd find a whole bunch, wouldn't we? But let's remember that if all of us made copies, there would be maybe... A hundred mistakes or more, maybe two hundred mistakes, but look how many pages we'd have. Let me tell you something. Making a copy, a handwritten copy, we're not talking about Xerox. We're not talking, uh, maybe I ought to get up. You know, we're not talking about a copy machine. We're talking about doing it by hand. That wouldn't be so easy, would it? When I was uh, translating the New Testament, that was back before the days of computers, back in the 70s, and I was translating a number of books. I would write out the line by hand in Greek, and then I would put a rough translation that was very, very literal underneath it, kind of like an interlinear, and then I would smooth it out on a third level. And it was a wonderful exercise in learning about the Bible and what the New Testament said. But I suspect whenever you start thinking about all of the little accent marks and all of the other little marks that go into that, that I've probably made a few mistakes in copying the New Testament. And you would too, probably. So what I'm saying is, if you made a mistake, but nobody else made the mistake that you made at that particular point, and we looked at the other copies and examined them, we'd say, Oh, he made a mistake here, or she made a mistake there, but nobody else made the same mistake. We'd say, oh, that was a mistake. Yes, it's a variant. It would be different. But we would know that there was something wrong with it because nobody else did that. And so whenever we made our copy or made a final copy after looking at all of these different copies of Philippians, we'd get it right, wouldn't we? Now, maybe two or three people made a mistake at the same place, but maybe the others didn't. The 65 others didn't. You see, that's the kind of thing we have. The certainty we have in the New Testament is the fact that, yes, we understand people are imperfect, but not everybody's imperfect at the same place. And so we can have confidence in the text. Now, do we have any uh, English scholars here that maybe have studied the writings of, uh, of Shakespeare? Have anybody studied Shakespeare? Maybe an English major. Maybe you took a course in Shakespeare. Do you know that there are more that there are more variants? That there are more different readings of various passages in the works of Shakespeare? than there are in the New Testament. Did you know that? That we have far more certainty in what is written in the New Testament than we do in what's written in Shakespeare. Yes, that's true. That's true. And I've had English teachers that were sitting out in the audience and said, you're right, and I was glad. <laughs> because it is true. There is no book, ancient or modern, that has been more scrutinized, more looked at than the New Testament. Now let me mention one other thing about the Bible before I go any farther. Of all the books, ancient or modern, there is no book, ancient or modern, that has exact, specific, detailed predictions made hundreds of years in advance that came to be true as you find in the Bible. 
You don't have anything else that is anywhere near like it. You can go through the books of other religious groups, even their, what they think of as their divine books. None of them have the kind of predictions that the Bible has. Psalm 22, 16, the piercing of the hands and the feet. In that uh, psalm that is very messianic and is very much about the death of Jesus because in that same psalm it talks about how they would gamble for his clothes and how that his uh, bones would be bare and all those things. Psalm 22 is a very, very messianic passage about the death of Jesus but talks about the piercing of the hands and the feet. Who wrote that? David wrote that. When did he write that? A thousand years before the time of Jesus. A thousand years before Jesus was born. The Babylonians in the 600s B.C., 400 years later, were the first ones ever to crucify anyone. The Greeks learned it from the Babylonians. And the Romans learned it from the Greeks. But here was David talking about a form of death that nobody for 400 years would ever use as a means of execution. The piercing of the hands and the feet in crucifixion. There have been people all through the ages that read Isaiah 53. And they couldn't believe who Isaiah 53 was talking about. And they've looked at this person and they've looked at that person, but only Jesus could fit the exact specific details that could be found in Isaiah 53. 30 pieces of silver? Mm. Yeah, that's predicted. How about Micah 5 and verse 2, where it says about Bethlehem Ephrathah, that that's where this king would come from. And do you remember whenever the Magi, the wise men came? And whenever they went and they asked the question to Herod, where is the Messiah to be born? Where is he to be born? And they asked all of the Jewish rabbis and they said, all these scholars said, oh, we know where he's going to be born. He's going to be born in Bethlehem Ephrathah, Bethlehem of Judah. By the way, there is a Bethlehem in the north too. But Bethlehem Ephrathah, that was the place where Rachel died. And Rachel's tomb can be seen even to this day in Bethlehem. And she was weeping for her children. They knew. How did they know? Because they had read Micah 5 and verse 2. If you were a boy growing up in Judaism in the first century, and John the Baptist came along, and I would almost challenge you to read that first chapter of the gospel according to John. And look at all of the names and all of the things that are said about Jesus. And remembering that people like Peter and Andrew and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew. All of these people, or Nathaniel was mentioned there. Uh, all of these people were, they were uh, disciples of John before they were disciples of Jesus. They had been there at the baptism. And you remember how they were seeking and they had studied these prophecies of what the Messiah would be like all through the ages. And you remember the words, we have found him. We have found him speaking of the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now that to me is an amazing thing. Someone says, well, Nazareth is never mentioned in the Old Testament. And it's not. Little bitty village, only about 300 people on the side of that mountain overlooking the plain of Judge Real. I've been there. Beautiful place. Well, how did he get the Nazarene? He's called the Nazarene. Matthew says that. Well, the word Nazarene is very much akin to the Hebrew term Netzer, which is found in the Old Testament in Isaiah, which speaks of the branch. The branch that comes from the root of Jesse, the Nazarene, the Nazarene. So you see all of these things come out very, very clearly. The 
prophetic things. Sometimes we have forgotten that there are 65 prophecies in the Old Testament of the Messiah. Someone says there are as many as 300 illusions of his coming. But there are 65 really specific prophecies. These are things that help me to have confidence in the word of God. That is true. That it's reliable. That it's there. That it is ancient and it did come from God. Because only God could have known those things. Only God could have known those things. You remember in the Old Testament there was the uh, test of who is going to be a prophet. And that test of a prophet is if he speaks something and it comes to be true. And he says God said it and it comes to be true. That's a prophet that you shall fear. But he says if he says something that's coming to be true but he points to some other person not the God who made us, then you shall not fear that person. Or if he says something and it doesn't come true, you shall not fear that person. Here you have a situation where we can test things. And when the test is put to the prophecies, we can have confidence. We can trust the Bible. Oh, if I had a lot more time, I would talk about prophecies. Prophecies like in the Old Testament dealing with the city of Caesarea by the sea. All of the things that took place there. Not Caesarea, but Sidon. Excuse me. Sidon. And some of the things that took place there. I would talk about the things that took place in various locations like Babylon. What would happen to Babylon. And do you know it's only been in the last, oh, maybe 50 years that they even knew where Babylon was. Because it had been covered up with sand. And just like the Old Testament says, it's now the home of jackals and other wild beasts. Nobody lives there. Here was one that struck me when I was in Israel. I, I visited Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin. And you remember that whenever in Matthew 10 he sent the twelve out, he gave them power over the over the demons and over everything and they had the power to, to do things and they came back and some of them came back and they said well we went to these places and they didn't believe, they didn't accept us interestingly these were places where Jesus did many of his miracles but Capernaum did not accept Jesus many of the people that were in Bethsaida did not accept Jesus and look at the curse that Jesus placed upon Bethlehem, excuse me, on, on uh, uh, Capernaum, and then Bethsaida, and then also Chorazin. I've been to all three of these places, and they are nothing but ruins, because Jesus cursed them. He cursed them, and that they would not uh, have anyone there. And you know what? If you go to Capernaum today... You all you find are ruins. There's no city there anymore. You can go to Bethsaida, which was the most prominent city of that area, a walled city where the Romans had their taxes and where they had their centurions and they had their soldiers. There's nothing in Bethsaida. You go to Chorazin. There's nothing in Chorazin. When Jesus curses a place, it stays cursed. When Jesus blesses people, they stay blessed. There is a big difference between belonging to God and not belonging to God. There's a big difference between being saved and being lost. Between being blessed and being cursed. Between going to heaven and not going there's a big difference. Well, I think that's probably as much as I wanted to say tonight. Uh, much of what I've talked about and many more things are in a chapter of a book that's never been published that I wrote three or four years ago and hopefully it will be published one of these days. But these are some things that I think are quite valuable and needs to be, they need to be said, they need to be told that you can trust your Bible. If I had a little more time, I would talk about a fellow named Green Lee who had some tests of how to establish whether or not the books of the New Testament 
could be proved, could be used to prove something in court. Simon Greenleaf was a law professor who wrote books on evidence that were used for decades in the 1800s. And he examined the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he looked at the things that took place in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And the conclusion he came to is these evidences would stand up in court. Stand up in court. Tonight it might be that you've had your faith a little low in past days. I hope what we have done tonight in studying has built up your hope and built up your faith. Built up your conviction. I wanted to come and to give you a shot in the arm. And a reason to believe. And a reason to get busy again. And to come alive. Rise up, O men of God. Be done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength. And serve the King of Kings. Folks, there is a time for us to rise up. And to be the people of God. It may be that if you in your heart have begun to have a glimmer of hope and faith again, then rise up and live what you know to be true. If there is some need in your life, maybe you're not a Christian yet, to believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, to repent of your sins, to confess His name, that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God and to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Then tonight would be a good time to do that. I'm sure that Brian would be glad to immerse you. Maybe you're a Christian brother or sister and your heart has been hardened a little bit. Maybe you haven't had the strong faith that you had at one time. Maybe you've let all of the things that have happened in this world to discourage you. I would say to you, maybe tonight is the night for you to begin thinking about getting your faith back and to be strong. If there is a need that we've talked about in your heart and in your life to make a change, we pray you'll respond while we stand and sing. Tread where he